Welcome. Welcome to this, uh, first, morning, to this first session uh, of the day. So today we're going to discuss uh, Java EE and its feature, namely EE4J. Um, first, I have to admit uh, that I was a little bit worried about the, uh, coming here, about the weather. So this is my fourth conference uh, in 2018. The first one was in uh, Hawaii, uh, mid-January, over 30, 30 degrees. Then I went to France, barely 10 degrees. Earlier this week, I was in Finland, minus 10, but this is okay. Uh, so, uh, let's step back uh, a little bit. Uh, last year, I was at uh, this same conference where I gave a talk on uh, Java EE8, and someone in the audience tweeted that it's not a real conference unless you read Oracle Seferber's statement at least once. So please enjoy. Okay, I guess you have the, you had the time to read it. Um, so last year I also used that slide uh, because at that time there were a lot of questions regarding Java EE. Um, questions about the fact that uh, Java EE8, if Java EE8 would be released or not, if so, when, and also a general question about the future of the platform. Some people had doubt and issue about the fact that Oracle uh, is the specification lead of the platform. So basically, Oracle was in the driving seat, and some people expressed concern about that, and so on. Nevertheless, um, it's really good to be back, because I mean, we are clearly at an exciting time regarding the Java platform. And I have good news to bring, obviously. So the first one is that, since then, Java E8 has been finalized and released. So in September last year, we have finalized all the specification of uh, Java EE8, so that means the umbrella specification, but also all the underlying specifications, such as JAX REST 2, uh, 2 one, sorry, uh, CDI 2, bin validation 2, uh, and so on, and so on. At the same time, we also released Glassfish 5, which is the open source reference implementation. So that basically means that since then, you can take Glassfish 5 and use Java EE8 in production if you want. Um, hopefully, we will see over time other application server adopt Java E8. On our side, Oracle, we said that uh, at some point in time, uh, WebLogic will also support Java E8. So, I mean, since last year, uh, first, Java E8 is done. So there is no question about if it will be done or when it will be done. This is a done deal. But this doesn't address the question about the fact that Oracle was basically in the driving seat. So, during the summer, we also said that we basically want to reboot the way the Java platform evolved. Um, we said that we basically want to put everything on the table, on the table to make sure that uh, we have, we change the way the platform evolves so that it can evolve more quickly, so that people can more easily contribute to the evolution of, to the, evolution of the platform, and also that the platform is more able to cope, in a, more able to cope quickly with the market needs typically being more cloud native than it is today. So we say that we want to do that within an open source foundation. Since then, we have selected that uh, open source foundation, that is the Eclipse Foundation. But the thing that is key is that before we did that, we didn't want to do that alone. We want to make sure that the key Java e ecosystem stakeholder were with, with us. So we had discussion with IBM and Red Hat first. I mean, the two major uh, Java e uh, stakeholders in addition to Oracle, and they were with us. And since then, others have joined uh, the group. Like, for example, we have Payara, which is working on Glassfish Fork. We have the folks at uh, Tommy Tribe, who are working on Tommy. So basically, we are together in this effort to try to move the platform forward. Now, some people are asking why Eclipse. I will not go into the details, but First, before selecting Eclipse, we basically um, had discussion with different open source or, um, foundation like Apache, the Linux Foundation, and the Eclipse Foundation. And at the end, we decided the Eclipse Foundation for multiple reasons. First, Eclipse is a very Java-friendly uh, foundation, um, and also Java-E friendly. If you look, for example, Eclipse Links, which is the GPA reference implement implementation, it's already hosted at Eclipse. Eclipse is already hosting, is also hosting uh, Yason, which is the JSONB reference implementation, so yet another uh, Java e technology. 
Um, Eclipse is also uh, hosting a key project which is called MicroProfile. And if you have been looking, well, if you have been following the news, MicroProfile is basically a project that is aiming at augmenting the Java uh, platform for, for it being more microservices oriented. So clearly today we are not talking about merging the two projects. But clearly over time, uh, what we do hope, uh, is to see convergence between the two projects. So EE4J, I mean the platform itself, and the micro profile, which is adding some nice uh, capabilities to this platform. So there are a bunch of reasons why we thought that uh, Eclipse was the best choice to host that project going forward. Now, something I want to make it clear, because some people are confused about that, about that. E4J has nothing to do with Eclipse DIDE. I mean, the only common point is that those are two Java-based projects which are hosted at the Eclipse Foundation. So E4J will work with, obviously, the Eclipse IDE, but also with NetBeans, Visual Code, uh, IntelliJ, and so on. There's, it's, it's really uh, something that is important because some people are confused about that. It has no, E4J has nothing to do with the Eclipse IDE, right? So the long term of the EE, pro, of the EE well, the end goal of the EE project is basically to put everything in place so that we can evolve the enterprise Java platform at a more rapid pace, uh, in a more easy way, so people are, more, are able to more easily contribute. Um, we want to do that in a vendor neutral way, so it's not Oracle anymore who is in the driver's seat to lead that effort. So this is really the end goal, how we can evolve the platform to make sure that the platform stays relevant for the next 10, 50, 20 years that are coming. But if, before we get there, we have things uh, to do. So short term, the EE4J project objectives uh, are the following. And when I say short terms, we are talking in a matter of weeks. First, uh, EE4J wants to, sh to ship a Java E compliant release as quickly as possible. There are multiple reasons why we want to do that. One of the reasons is that um, EE4J will, use, will start to evolve from uh, Java EE8. So um, we want to ship a Java e, uh, EE4J uh, implementation, so let's call it EE4J 1.0, because we are, right now we don't have a better name. And that implementation will have to uh, be compatible with EE8. So that basically means that you take the EE4J code base and you will be able to build an implementation that is fully compatible with EE8. So we need to do that That's for multiple reasons. One of the reasons is that we basically have to make sure that everything is working on the EE4J side. So that basically means all the code base, um, also all the testing suite, given that uh, compatibility is a key aspect of the platform, we want to make sure that Whenever we have an EE4J implementation, we have the ability to make sure that it's compliant to uh, the specification, to the technology. And also we have to do that to basically do some kind of, as a proof, so you are able to take the EE4J code base and everything is working, including the build infrastructure, all the repository are there, everything on the Bevan side has been uh, solved and so on. So, we think that this is really uh, uh, the first step that needs to be uh, addressed. And it's something that we are working on since uh, quite a few months now. Now, we also want uh, to do that to start to foster an ecosystem around that code base. So we need to do that as soon as possible. And uh, a good example is that no later than yesterday, or maybe it was on Monday, the folks at Lightband have put a proposal on how they they think that reactive streams might be used in E4J. So that's a very good example. I mean, Lightband has never been attached to Java EE, but now that everything is open through the E4J project, we have folks, with, folks such as Lightband with very good knowledge around the reactive space that are looking at helping the platform to move uh, forward. So those are the very short-term uh, objectives of the E4J project. And midterms, there are other objectives, like um, defining the process that will be used to evolve the different technology within the platform. So the GCP will not be used uh, within the EE4J project. So that means that the EE4J folks have to put everything in place to exactly define how a specification will be evolved. Um, everything which is tied to the compatibility and the branding, something that will also be addressed. 
we want to preserve this notion of compatibility. So that's something that will also be uh, addressed. And so on, and so on. So there are many things that will uh, be uh, tackled mid-terms, mid and this is something that is already happening today. So for example, a few, well, I think it was maybe last week, um, there is a draft charter for uh, what we call the e.next working group. So this working group is basically uh, the working group that will tackle all those issues. So the branding, the compatibility, uh, the process to evolve the technology, and so on. And the draft char charter of that group has been um, published, um, I think it was last week. So it's, it's something that is available and that you can already uh, see. So all those goals, so the short-term goals, the mid-term goals, are basically uh, to make sure that everything is in place so that E4J uh, can evolve um, and reach its, uh, its final goals. Now, it's not something that happened overnight. So where are we today? Well, first we have a PMC, so a project management committee uh, that is in place. So the PMC is dealing with all the day-to-day activities. Uh, it's composed of representatives from different companies, IBM, Oracle, Red Hat, and so on. And it's led by uh, Ivar Grimstad from Cybercom. Um, something else that is going on is the brand name. So E4J is the project name. And uh, we recognize that the brand is important. So the Work is going on to define what that brand will be. And I, I was hoping that I would be able to uh, give you some of the potential name uh, today, but uh, it's, well, it might still happen today, but it's not anyway uh, done uh, as of now. But so we had a bunch of proposals coming from the community. Um, from that, uh, the PMC has made a shortlist. That shortlist where, uh, went through uh, legal and uh, trademark and so on. So very soon, very soon, like might be still today, we will put that, those um, propose, those, so those potential brand name options, and we will ask the community to vote for on those. So now we are talking about an open source project. So where are we on the code front? Because it's nice to work on the brand, it's nice to work on the committee and so on, but if we don't have any code, it's uh, meaningless. Uh, it's not an easy task, moving everything from the Java e organization to the EE4J Eclipse organization is certainly not an easy task. In fact, I think it's the largest project that uh, Eclipse has embarked as of today. So we already have a bunch of uh, GitHub repo which has been created, uh, like nine, I, th I think. Um, few more are coming very soon, like Eclipse Jersey. Yeah, we need to use those new, na those new names now, but Jersey will soon be on the EE4J side. Mojara, which is the GSF re reference implementation, will also uh, pop up shortly. And then we'll tackle JSONB, concurrency, security, and so on. And the idea is that over time, I mean, I don't have any definitive date to give, but uh, one, two, three months maybe, everything will be on the EE4J side. You will be able to use that code base to, to build a fully com Java 8 compatible uh, implementation. So that's basically where we are on the E4J uh, side front. The key thing is that we are putting every, everything in, in place so that the platform can evolve in a vendor neutral way and at a more rapid pace. The key aspect from a technology point of view is that E4J will start from Java EE8. So next I will give you a quick sneak peek on, at what's inside Java EE8. So that's basically E4J 1.0. It's really the same. So in uh, Java EE8, the first API that has been updated is JAXRS. I don't have the time to go in all the details, but I just want to highlight a few uh, key aspects. So in JAXRS2, Java EE7, we have added the client-side capability. So basically an API that you can use to easily consume a REST endpoint. So it works like this. So you have a client-side container. From this client, you need, to, sorry, from, from this container, you need to have an instance of it. So client builder, new client. From the client, you build a web target. That's basically where on the network my remote endpoint is. And from the target, you build a request. And at some point in time, you invoke the request to hopefully get some answer back from the remote endpoint. The thing is that um, if you look at this example, this is a blocking call. So that means that my, my, my get method will not return until I get the answer from the remote endpoint. Uh, in JAXRS2, we have also added asynchronous capabilities. 
So this is the same example, but this time I'm using the async invoker. So you see there is this async method. This is basically used to tell to the JAXRS client container that this is an asynchronous request. And if you look at the return type of that invocation, it's a future object. So that basically means that I have an object that I will be able to use at some point in time to get the result from the remote endpoint, result or the error which has been thrown uh, during that request invocation. Now, the issue here is that as soon as you do a get on a future object, you are basically blocking again. So we haven't really solved the blocking, nature, the blocking issue with that approach. Something else which is uh, available in JAXRS2 is an asynchronous facility uh, callback that solved that, uh, that blocking issue. So it works like this. So I'm using the async invoker. This is an asynchron asynchronous request invocation. But this time, I have the ability to pass it an invocation callback with two callbacks. The first callback is the callback that will be invoked when we have the result from the remote endpoint. So this is an asynchronous uh, callback. And the second one is the one that will be invoked if something goes wrong. So this is something that is already available in JAXRS2, so it's not new to Java 8. The thing is that as soon as you have multiple request invocation that needs to be chained together, this approach is very difficult to apply because you are basically going through a callback hell. With one request, it works fine. If you have multiple requests, good luck in trying to uh, deal with error and so on. So this is solved in JAXRS21, Java 8, with the addition of a third invoker, an asynchronous reactive invoker that you see at the bottom of the slide. So it works the same way. So instead of using async, we are using Rx. And if you look at the return type, it's not a future object, it's a completion stage uh, object of the response that will be sent by the remote endpoint. So the completion stage API is an API that was added to Java IC8, where we have this facility that allows us to basically um, chain multiple asynchronous tasks. So those stages are, uh, are basically asynchronous stage, uh, sorry, asynchronous task, and the completion of one stage can trigger the execution of another stage. So we basically have everything in place to easily define multiple asynchronous request invocation. So we can do something like that in JAXRS21. So I have a first request. It returns a completion stage. I have a second request. So the first request goes to a services that gives me my IP address. The second request is wrapped in a function. So it gets uh, a JSON object and it returns a JSON object. So the second request goes to an external services that from a given IP address uh, returns some geolocal geolocalization information from that given address. So I have those two requests. Then what I need to do, I just need to define the dependencies between those two requests, so basically the pipelines. So I do the first request. When I have the, when I have the result from the first request, I use the then compose to invoke my function, function that will get the result of the first request and will do uh, an asynchronous JAXRS request to my second services. And then I just need to do something with the result. Here I'm using the then accept and I pass it a consumer to just print the result. So that's something that you can do uh, with JAXRS to one. And clearly, the idea of that uh, reactive um, API is basically as soon as you have multiple requests that have some kind of dependency, so you first need to invoke service A, then service B, and depending on the result from service B, you need to go to service C or D, then you'd better use that API. It will be uh, way easier to do than using the pure asynchronous API of JAXRS2. And not only that, so this API is using the completion stage API of uh, Java SE8, but we acknowledge that there are other reactive API on the market. So the specification, the JAXRS specification, has been designed in a way to, that it allows other solutions to be used. If, you, if we look at Jersey, so obviously we have to support the completion stage API, but we also support uh, RxJava and RxJava2 and uh, Guava listenable feature. So the specification is open to other solutions. It's up to the implementation uh, provider to decide which additional API you want to support. Something else that is part of JAXRS2 is SSE, server sent event. So it's basically a mechanism that is used to push in an asynchronous fashion payload from the server to the client. It's one way only, so the client establishes the connection and then the server has a mean, as a channel to push in an async fashion some payload to that client. So we're adding support for that in JAXRS on the server side and on the client side. And obviously you can mix and match. For example, you can use JAXRS SSC server side API with a client side API from a browser, for example. 
So JAXRS21 is introducing a new interface, SSE event. It's a super interface that basically represents an event. It's extended on the two sides of the connection. So we have outbound SSE event um, on the server side, and we have inbound SSE event on the client side. The thing that is key is that it's a one-way only uh, protocol. So you will create event on the server, and on the client side, you will just consume those events. We have this SSE event thing, uh, ob object, which is basically uh, a connection between two endpoints. Um, so how it works? So this is the server-side view. So this is a JAXRS resource method, nothing really new there. The only thing is that we are injecting this new type, SSE event thing, and this new uh, SSE uh, type, which represents some context object that, are just, that is just helping us to write more concise code. We are using the standard JAXRS uh, annotation, nothing new on that front. Then, whenever our server-side code needs to push some payload to that connected client, we are just using the connection object, we invoke the send method on it, and we pass it some SSC payload. We do that as needed, and obviously at some point in time, we'll have to, we'll have to make sure that we do close the connection. So it's very easy to, to do, nothing really new on that front, except that the new specific SSC type. On the client side, we also have a connection object, but this time it's called SSC event source. Um, it works using, obviously, the JAXRS client container. So we have a client container. We need to set the web target. That's basically the URL of the remote SSC endpoint. Uh, so we set the target on the connection. We have the ability to, uh, rec to configure the connection itself. And then we invoke the build method. So that's basically where we build the connection object. We are not establishing the connection here. Then we'll have to register a few callbacks. Uh, the one that you want to make sure to register at least is the one that will consume inbound SSE event type. So that guy will basically be invoked at uh, any time some event is coming on that channel. You can also invoke a consumer that will consume throwable. If something goes wrong, that's where you will deal with the error. And then you just need to uh, open the connection. So you take the connection ob object, open, and you're done. The um, JAXRS client container will do all, all the heavy lifting uh, for you, establishing the connection, registering the callback, and so on and so on. And we'll see, once you are, when you are done, you need to make sure that you close the connection. So this new reactive invoker and SSC are basically the two main new capabilities that have been added in JAXRS21, but there, there are a bunch of other uh, things that I don't have the time to discuss today. So let's move on. On the JSON front in Java E8, so uh, E4J1.0, uh, we have two API. We have updated JSONP to JSONP11, and we have added a new binding API, the JSON binding API. So the goal of the JSONP API, so the update that we did in E8, is basically to adopt new standards from the JSON space. Like, for example, JSON pointer. A pointer is basically a syntax that can be used to easily reference a location within a JSON document. So um, you have example of that uh, syntax there, slash event, slash location. So slash event means we want to have the key value whose key is event. And then within that object, we want to have the key value whose key uh, is location. So it's, it's kind of regex, but for JSON. How would work on the Java side? So we have this JSON P object that is called JSON event. Uh, whose, represent, whose JSON representation is on the right side of the slide. So if we want to use a pointer, we first need to create the pointer itself. So slash one slash venue means sla mean we want to have the object at index one. So we're talking about the second object. And slash venue want to have the key value in that object whose key is venue. We just have defined the pointer. Now we need to do something with it. So we have multiple operations that we can use. Get value is one of those operations. So in this case, we would get Hilton. Uh, replace is another operation that we can use with pointer. Uh, the thing that is key here is that the JSONP API is an immutable API. So that means that uh, if you are, for example, doing a replace, what you will get in return is a new object. You will not change the original object. So that's something important to keep in mind. So we have get value, we have replace, and um, we also have a had remove and contains value operation that we can use with JSON pointer. So it's a very easy to use API to basically uh, deal with um, JSON document. Another standard that is part of the JSONP11 update is JSON patch. 
Again, the name is very obvious. A patch is basically used to modify a document. So JSON patch, we have a JSON document that contains one or more operation that will be applied to another, to another JSON document to modify that JSON document. The patch is atomic, so if one of the operations that you have in your JSON patch fails, the complete patch uh, will be aborted. So this is an example of the patch. So on the left side, you have the patch. On the right side, you have the target. So basically, which the document that you want to apply the patch to. So the first operation is a replace operation. We are using the JSON pointer syntax. So we basically want to replace um, Hilton. So slash zero mean the first object, slash venue, we want to replace the venue within that object. So we basically want to replace uh, Hilton with Moscone West. Fine. It works, so we can move on to the next operation, which is an add operation. So we want to add a new key value. Uh, and this case, in, this this, in this example, we want to have the previous name key value within object uh, zero. So we basically want to add previous venue and uh, it's Hilton. So this is basically how it works on the uh, JSON side. Now, if we look at the Java API that is part of JSON P11, it's a very simple API too. So we have two JSON documents. So we have a JSON document that contains one or more oper operations, so that's basically the patch, and then we have another JSON document that we will apply the patch to. So first, we need to create a patch from a JSON document. So JSON create patch, we pass it a JSON document, and then we just need to apply the patch to a JSON target. Again, this is an immutable API, so what I'm getting here is a new object. I'm not changing the original object. Now, we also have this uh, builder pattern based API that we can use to uh, basically dynamically construct and more easily construct uh, a JSON patch. So this time we have a copy operation, we have a replace operation, we have a had operation, and obviously we need to build the patch. And once we have the patch, we need to apply the patch uh, to a target. So that was a very short overview of JSON P11. Uh, JSON P11 also had support for JSON merge patch. So it's a different way of modifying a JSON document. Um, so we have patch and merge patch in JSON P11, but we also, so patch and merge patch are used to modify a JSON document. We also have the reverse operation. So basically a diff operation that will give you, for example, a JSON patch that will describe the difference between two JSON documents. Uh, JSONP11 also had support for uh, JSONP collectors, so you can use the stream API without having to define your own custom JSONP collectors. It's something that is provided by the JSONP11 API, and so on and so on. So a lot of good stuff in JSONP11. But more importantly, what we are doing on the JSON front is that we are adding a new API that will basically do the marshalling and unmarshalling from Java object to and from JSON document. So the specification, the JSONB specification, defines the default behavior. So if you don't specify anything, you will obtain a very common behavior. And obviously, you as a developer will have the ability to override uh, that behavior. So this is an example. So uh, we have a POJO. It's a list of events. So it's a Java object. And we want to turn that into a JSON document that we have on the right side. So how the JSONP API works? First, we need to have a JSONB object. Everything is done on that object. So JSON builder create will get us that object. I'm not specifying anything, so that means that I will basically get the default uh, behavior. And then I just need to use on my JSONB object the to JSON method. I pass it my Java object, and what I get in return is a string that will contain uh, this JSON uh, representation that we have on the right side. So it's very easy to, to, to use. Obviously, it works the other way around. So this time, uh, we have a string with a given uh, JSON payload that we have on the right side, and we want to convert that to a Java object. Again, I need to have an instance of a JSONB object, JSON, build, JSON builder create. I'm not specifying anything, so that is the default uh, behavior that I will get. And then instead of using the to JSON method, I will use the from JSON method. So from JSON, I pass it my uh, JSON payload, and also pass it the type that I want to cast to to be cast to, and I will get a Java object that would contain all, basically all the information, all the payload that is in my JSON document. Obviously, you have the ability to customize the behavior of the JSONB API. So for example, if you look at the top right side of the slides, 
Um, if, so if I don't specify anything, my uh, value for the event name would be event name. That's basically the, the field value, the, the default value. But given that I'm using this new annotation, a JSONB property, it, would be, it will be conference instead of uh, event name. So we have a few annotations that we can use in the JSONB API to basically override the default behavior, so customize the API. You can apply that at a different level. But name, well, the field name is not the only thing that you can uh, customize. So you can customize the naming strategy. So we provide, I think, seven uh, different naming strategy, and if that's not enough, you have the ability to add your own. In which order the property should be laid out? Uh, what should we do if you have binary data to deal with? Um, maybe there are some, so in the transformation, there are some properties that that doesn't need to be carried over because, for example, they are compute or they are irrelevant. What should we do with null values? By default, they are ignored, but in some cases, you might want to carry them during the conversion, and so on and so on. So there are a bunch of things that can be uh, customized. And to do that, you will either use the JSONB annotation or you will use this new uh, JSONB config object. So you will create a configuration object with all the behavior that you want to get, and you will pass that object uh, to when you are creating your JSONB instance, and you will obtain that uh, customized behavior. Now, that's how it works. Something that I didn't mention about the JSONB API is that there are already a lot of solutions that are providing uh, JSONB marshalling and unmarshalling. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel with that API. This API is just a standard API that can sit on top of existing solution. So if you, you as a developer, have the ability to switch to different uh, JSONB frameworks, underlying frameworks. If you, don't specify, if you don't specify anything, you will use Eclipse JSON, which is the reference implementation, but you have the ability to use a different provider. To do that, you just specify which one you want to use when you are creating your uh, JSONB object. So this is really a standard API that can sit on top of existing solution. It's one key aspect of that API. So moving on, uh, we also did some nice update on the web front in uh, e Java EE8, EE4J 1.0. One of the key API that has been updated is the Servlet API. So many things have been done in Servlet 4, but the key feature of Servlet 4 is basically to bring HTTP2 support to the platform. So obviously we're talking about server-side HTTP2 support. Now, I don't have the time to really go into the details about HTTP2, but HTTP2 is basically about reducing latency of web application. And if you just have to remember two things about HTTP2, first, HTTP2 is a binary-based protocol. HTTP 1.1 is a text-based protocol, so that's already a big change. So uh, in HTTP 1.1, if you, for example, you need to render a page that needs 100 resources. Your client, to fetch those resources, will have to do something like 50 uh, physical connection. And on those physical connections, the client will be able to do like two HTTP requests. It depends, but that's the idea. So that means that to render one page with 100 resources, the client will have to open like 50 uh, physical connections, which is very expensive on the client side, but also on the server side. In HTTP2, everything happens over one single TCP socket. So we have one connection, and over that connection, the client can open multiple logical con connections, which are called streams. So it's way more efficient. So this is one of the big difference between HTTP2 and HTTP1.1. HTTP2 is binary based. And, well, there are other differences, but this is the key aspect. And something which is even more importantly for you developers is that HTTP2 doesn't change the semantic that we have been using for years. So we still have this notion of request response. We still have this notion of cookies, headers, uh, and so on and so on. So nothing changed on that front. So that means that if you take today your servlet application, so you take your war, uh, you deploy it on top of a servlet 4 container, out of the box it will be HTTP2 capable. You will not have to change your code unless you use a specific feature of HTTP2, which is called server push. So server push basically gives the ability to an HTTP2 server to proactively push resources to the client. So today with HTTP 1.1, the client do a request, the server will answer with one response. With HTTP2, the client do a request and the server has the ability to answer with one response or multiple response. And this is typically used to proactively put stuff in the client cache. So the client asks for an HTML page, 
the server knows that in order to render that page, the client will need to have that CSS and that picture and that JavaScript file. So the client has the page and the server can decide to not only answer with the HTML page, but also answer with the CSS, the JavaScript, and the picture that is needed to render that page. And again, this is done to basically reduce the overall latency of uh, the application. So if you want to use server push, then you will have to adapt your code for that. Uh, server push is always based on an incoming request. So it's not like SSC. Server push is not about giving an asynchronous way to push stuff to the client. There is an incoming request and the server can decide to answer with just one resp response or more response. So we have this incoming request. If we want to push stuff, we take that request, new push builder. Basically, we want to have the push builder for, th for that given request. Then we have the ability to set some headers that will be attached to the response that will push the stuff that we want to push. Then we just need to specify the path and we invoke the push method. So this is basically a way to tell to the servlet container, okay, I want you to try to push these resources. There is no way to know if the resources will be effectively pushed or not. Because it might happen that the resources are already on the client cache and the client might decide to just refuse that resources. But anyway, this is a very nice feature. So moving on on the web front, um, GSF 2.3, so Java Server Faces, has been updated. One of the nice things about uh, GSF 2.3 is that it supports HTTP 2 out of the box, including server push. So you take your existing uh, GSF application, you deploy it on top of a servlet for GSF 2.3 container, and automatically your GSF framework will try to push the resources which are needed to render the pages. So you don't even have to change your application. And then there are a bunch of other stuff which have been uh, added to GSF uh, 2.3, like uh, WebSocket component. So it's basically a way to use WebSocket technology without having to deal with any WebSocket-specific API. You are just using the standard uh, GSF API, and so on, and so on. So some quite nice stuff there. So moving on, uh, in Java EE8, CDI 2 and bin validation have been updated too. So those two specifications are led by our friends at Red Hat. And if we look at CDI 2, it's, um, well, first, it's a key technology of the platform. What I mean by that is that a lot of other APIs in the platform are using CDI in a way or in, a, in another. Bin validation, C, uh, GSF, uh, JAXRS, uh, the security API, and so on and so on. So basically, all those API are using, are relying on uh, CDI. The issue with CDI is that it's a quite large specification. For us, it's not, a, it's not, it's not really an issue. But if you are going to use CDI in a very lightweight application, typically a Java IC application, that's an issue for those persons. So the CDI uh, 2 specification has been made more light. So the specification has been split in three. So there's CDI core, based on that there's CDI for Java IC, and then based on that CDI for Java E. Obviously we, Java E, are consuming the whole thing, CDI for Java EE. And CDI 2 also defines how you can bootstrap a CDI container using just Java IC. Again, it's not something that is important for us Java developers today because CDI, the CDI lifecycle is managed by the Java E application server. So it's not something that we have to take care about. But anyway, that's something that might be useful going forward. So a lot of good stuff in CDI 2, but typically those new features are not really interesting uh, for us Java developers. Now, it doesn't mean that CDI 2 doesn't bring new capability for us. So something that we have in CDI since the beginning is this uh, event-based uh, API that we can use to, in a loosely fashion, fire event and consume those events. So somewhere in my application, I fire, I fire an event, I have the ability to attach some payload, and somewhere else, I will have at least one consumer. So a consumer is basically just a simple method that is using it as this at observe annotation to turn it into uh, a consumer. Obviously, my consumer will have the ability to will have the ability to work on the payload that has been attached um, to the event. I can also have multiple consumer, uh, mul so yeah, multiple observer. Um, the problem is that when you have multiple observer, you don't know in which order they will be invoked. And this is solved in CDI 2. You can define an ordering of uh, observer. The trick here is that we are using the add priority annotation and lower the priority higher the order will be. So 10 will be invoked before 20. This is how the, this uh, annotation works. So it's, it's, it's something that you need to keep in mind. The thing is that if you're looking at those uh, observer, 
everything, everything is done in a synchronous fashion. So I fire an event, and within the same thread, I'm consuming my event. So that means that my uh, producer will only uh, continue to uh, well, will only continue when the observer uh, is done. This is solved in CDI2 because now we have asynchronous event support. It works exactly the same way, but this time we are not using the fire. Uh, method, but we are using this new fire async method to specify that this is an asynchronous uh, invocation. And if you look at the return type, this is a completion stage um, object. So this is an object that we can use to get the result of the consumer, of the observer, sorry, uh, at some point in time. And this is an object that is very useful too if we want to see if something went wrong. And obviously, if we fire an event, we'll have to consume those events. So this is an asynchronous observer. We are just using this new at observes. Uh, annotation, right? So this is, uh, this, well, for me, this is one of the key aspects of CDI2. Moving on, uh, bin validation 2. Um, a lot of, of update in bin validation 2 to cope with uh, Java IC8. So Java EE8, EE4J1.0 is based on Java IC8. So whenever we had to do an update, we tried to make sure that we were leveraging Java IC8. You saw that CDI2 is using the compression stage API of uh, Java uh, AC8. Bin validation 2 is also trying to do that. So you have the ability, for example, to do constant validation with the new optional type container. Sorry. Um, you, given that you can apply annotation in Java AC8 to different uh, location, we can now, for example, do validation on containers. So we have a list, for example, and we want to apply a validation on all the elements of a list. It's something that we can now do with bit validation. We can do constraint validation using the new date and time API, and so on. So a lot of good stuff that are based on uh, the new Java AC8 capabilities in bin validation 2. And then bin validation 2 is also adding new uh, constraint validation that were part of Hibernate Validator, which is the reference implementation. And basically, they are taking those constraint validation, which were widely used, and they, they've standardized them so that they can be more uh, broadly uh, be made available. So that's a very, a very quick sneak peek at bin validation 2. And last but not least, we're also adding a new security API in uh, Java EE8. Now, the name is a, little, is a little bit misleading because the fact that we're adding an API doesn't mean that the platform was not secure before. The goal of this API is really to simplify how you can apply security concern in your Java EE code and also fill some gaps that uh, we had. So one of the things that is added in this API is in the concept of an identity store. An identity store is basically uh, a location where you will store all the user details. Uh, out of the box, so the specification defined two identity store. We have an LDAP one and a database one. And to use those identity store, you just rely on the annotation this is an example, for example, for using the database identity store. So it's something that is very convenient. You also have the ability to add your own identity store. So if you are not using database or LDAP to store your user, you can define your own identity store. Something else that we're adding in the security API is a new authentication mechanism for web application. Again, we already had authentication capabilities in the Java platform, but this was done through uh, the JustPeak API, which is, which is a very difficult to use API. The goal is, here is to provide a very simple approach to, to apply in a programmatic fashion authentication for web, web application. So we support three uh, authentication mechanisms right now in this API, basic auth, form auth, and custom form auth. Um, we know that it's not enough. Something that I, sorry, I forgot to mention is that obviously the authentication mechanism ideally should rely on the identity store. Uh, it makes sense. So <clears throat> if you want to implement a new authentication mechanism in something, it's something that is very trivial. Uh, you have this interface, and I think there is only the validate request method that really needs to be implemented. So it's something that, um, that is easy to do. So, <coughs> sorry, this is an example on how all of that works. So we have a servlet. We want to secure that, ser that servlet, so we put a constraint, and only the user in a role foo are allowed to access that uh, resources. So I inject an HTTP um, authentication mechanism, that happens to be a custom one, so I'm providing a specific authentication mechanism. 
So I need to implement the validate request method. And not only that, I also want that my, my custom authentication mechanism rely on an identity store, which happened to be a custom one that I've defined it. So you see that basically using this new API really simplify how you can uh, put all the security concerns, all the security piece together. So we are getting towards the end. So wrap up. Java E8 is basically about modernization of the platform and simplification of the platform. So I went, I, so today I give you a very quick overview of some of the new capabilities had, that have been added in Java E8. Uh, but th there are more capabilities than that. For example, I didn't talk about GPA, which has been updated to support the, stream the, the, sorry, the Java AC8 stream API. So there are a lot more stuff to Java 8 than just what I covered today. The key thing is that uh, Java 8 is available, is available today, and we are clearly an, at an exciting period for um, Java 8, because we have Java 8, which is done, and uh, we are also working on EE4J. So basically, how we can evolve the, the, the Java E platforms in a at a more rapid pace with more community uh, engagement. And I think that, well, we already start to see some of the results uh, of that effort. I mean, uh, having the live and folks that want to help EE4J is, uh, is already a big win. And we are just at the beginning. We don't have ev we don't even have yet an EE4J 1.0 implementation. But that's clearly the, the short-term goals. Having as soon as possible everything on the E4J side to make sure that we can build a Java E8 uh, compatible imp uh, implementation. So if you are interested, I would clearly encourage you to uh, look at what is being discussed within the E4J project. For that, uh, you should at least follow that mailing list. There are a lot of discussion going on, uh, but it clearly shows that there are a lot of interest uh, around that. And with that, we have um, one or two minutes for questions. So is there any questions, remarks, or comments? At the back, yes. So uh, about the Yux RS 2.1 yes. client, does that support HTTP 2? No. The th well, that's a good question. So JAXRS 2.1 doesn't support HTTP 2, but it's not really something that is in the JAXRS uh, specification. So JAXRS, it's something that needs to be tackled at the implementation level. Having said that, um, I'm not really, well, we're not really sure that HTTP 2 will bring a lot of benefit to uh, REST services at this stage. But that's a good point. That's something that needs to be investigated. Any more questions? Yes, sir. What's your general feeling about, about What's your general feeling about, about, about uh, the, 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 the concept of, of, of rapid development? Uh, my impression of the Java EE community is that it is generally very conservative. That's a good point. And it's also one of the goals of uh, EE4J. So if you look before how Java EE was developed, it was uh, specification first, and then we work on the implementation. We want to change that. We want to have a more code-first approach on the E4J side, so we, we work on a prototype and so on, and then when, if that, that piece of code makes sense, we look at how we can uh, standardize that into the platform. So this is basically one of the key things also that we want to solve within E4J, having a, f a code first approach instead of spec first and then. Right, and any more questions? Did I see a hand over there? No? <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so I will be here uh, until uh, tonight, so you can uh, grab me uh, at any time. If you have other comments or questions, you can also find me on Twitter, at Delabasse, or just shoot me a mail. I'm always avail available. So with that, tack. Is that Thank the right you. word? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.